Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning, turn to the familiar passage of Acts, chapter number 9. Uh, the ninth chapter of Acts. We'll be looking here at just the first six verses this morning. And so taking a look at the conversion of the Apostle Paul, at least an aspect of it. Uh, and so in no way would this be exhaustive, but uh, I do think that there's a thought that, that we can glean from this morning that might help us in different places and different ones where we are in our lives and our walk with the Lord. Uh, and so in Acts chapter number nine, beginning in Verse 1, we read, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus and to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Paul asked a question, Who art thou? And this morning I want to speak on that thought in the form of a question, Who is Jesus? Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your working in our hearts and lives. Thank you that someone like Saul, who had dedicated his life to your destruction, was someone that found grace and mercy. Someone that you took and made something mighty out of. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see you in that light this morning. Help us to understand, uh, Lord, who you, not just who you are, but who you want to be to us. And Lord, may we let you do so. May you speak to our hearts now as we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. <clears throat> you know, if we went around... Uh, and ask that question uh, on across the country, at gas stations, in restaurants, on school campuses, in political halls. If you went and asked it abroad, you would get all kinds of different answers. In remote places, you might even occasionally get someone that doesn't know or hasn't heard that name and doesn't understand it, but I think for the most part that would be rare especially in the, in the Western Hemisphere it would be, and in the European nations, it would be very rare. Uh, most people have heard the name Jesus. Muslims know the name Jesus. They hold him and regard him as a prophet, a great prophet even, but they don't hold him as who he really is. And we look at this question and we think about the question is, Paul asked it here, Saul asked it as he's confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ. If I were to go around the room this morning, every one of us would say something along the lines of, well, he is the Son of God. Uh, he is my Savior. He is my Lord. He is, and all of those are things that he is and should be in our lives. Now, listen, just because Jesus is Lord doesn't mean he's my Lord. Just because he's my savior doesn't mean that I let him be the Lord of my life. Uh, there is the distinction of his position and my allowing him to fulfill that position within my heart, my mind, and my life. And so when you look and you think about this question and think about this young man, Saul. Saul knew the name Jesus. He knew who Jesus claimed to be. He knew who Jesus' followers claimed him to be. He was a man who had devoted his life to the study of the law of God. He was someone that was in ministry, someone that was committed to serve God and to, at a high level. He was not someone that was complacent or casual in his faith. He was not someone who lacked faith. He was someone that had a wrong picture of who Jesus truly was. And so as we look at this and consider him, we see in him a young man who is young at this point, 
probably in his 30s, maybe a little younger. We see someone who is zealous. By the way, zeal is a good thing, but zealotry is not. And Paul is more the zealot than someone that just has zeal. But he's zealous. He's, he's busy about serving God. He is, he is fired up about serving God. He is committed to sacrificing his time and his life and his energy uh, to serve God with all of his power and all of his strength. And he's even committed to the point that he's willing to forcibly cause others to conform to what his image of worshiping God should be. He's persecuted those that believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. He has gone so far as to take his knowledge and to take his zeal and to channel it to the point where those that have been around Jerusalem have been imprisoned and some have been executed and families have been torn apart to the point that they have fled back out into the countryside. And as they have fled, he's not willing and content that they would just be gone. He is anxious to pursue them uh, and to continue the destruction of the faith that they have found in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you were to ask Paul uh, at this point, Saul, who is Jesus? He would say uh, that he's a blasphemer. He would say he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. That's the way the Pharisees saw him. He would say that he is an imposter. He would say that he is a, uh, a liar, someone that claims to be someone that he is not. Uh, he would probably have held the line that uh, that whenever they uh, ask about the resurrection, that, that his disciples hid the body, he would have probably bought into that lie, though we don't know for certain what his viewpoint would have been on it, but clearly he did not accept that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and that Jesus was uh, the very Son of God. And so we see him, and we see him so determined that he would go to the high priest and he would seek legal authority. To, to go and to continue this persecution abroad and to bring them back to Jerusalem that they might be imprisoned, that they might be punished. And so he's on his way. And so the image that the Apostle Paul or the, the young man Saul has as he leaves Damascus of Jesus and the image that he has and the understanding that he has of Jesus when he arrives at Damascus are completely, complete polar opposites. He left wanting to persecute and to destroy him. He arrived saying, Lord, what would that have me to do? And along the way, we know what happened. We know how Jesus came to him. But you think about Saul and what the desire of the church was, and it was even expressed later uh, by some, whenever they were told to go and minister to him, they, they went fearfully because they knew who he was and they knew what his inclination was and what he was determined to do. And so they obeyed and they went, but they went fearfully because they, and rightfully so, from a human standpoint. So we see him, a young man who the church no doubtedly would have been praying for his destruction, that they might find some relief and some, uh, some deliverance from uh, the persecution of him. And he's on his way. And they're hearing, no doubt, reports that Saul is on his way to persecute you in Damascus. And they're trying to scramble. What am I going to do? How are we going to hide? Uh, <coughs> what are we going to what are we going to say? How are we going to uh, not be out in the open but yet continue to worship uh, the way that the Lord deserves and needs to be, wants to be worshipped? And they're going through all of this gamut of emotions. And so here he comes with a fierce look in his eye, with hatred in his heart, with a determination to destroy. And Jesus shows up. But Jesus doesn't show up to bring destruction to him. He doesn't show up to bring judgment upon him. Listen, if there was anyone at this time that deserved judgment from heaven to fall upon him on this road, it would have been Saul. If there was anyone that it would have been, uh, there would have been an expectation that, uh, that God's had enough and that he is going to protect his church and his children and he is going to do so by uh, eradicating this menace 
to this growing faith that is flourishing, that is spreading throughout the world, uh, then certainly everyone would have said a hearty amen and rejoiced at the death uh, and the destruction of Saul in a miraculous way at the hand of God. But Jesus didn't show up on the road to Damascus that day to bring judgment upon him. He showed up on the road to Damascus that day to bring mercy to him. To reveal to him the reality of who he was. To show him you have a perception and an understanding of who Jesus is, but it's not the right one. Let me blind you so that you can clearly see. Let me strike you down so that you may be humbled, so that I can raise you up. And so on the road, as Paul makes his way, or Saul makes his way, he sees the light, and he falls to the ground, and he hears the voice crying out to him, and rightfully discerns that it's God, but does not know in what form God is presenting himself. Who art thou, Lord I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. In that moment, he understood that the one that he so violently persecuted was in fact his Messiah. Amen. Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus. So Paul comes and this is no small thing. This is of the greatest of miracles. It's so great in fact that Paul never forgot his former condition. His transformation of life was so instantaneous, it was so complete, it was so fulfilled. Not that he didn't have a lot to learn. Not that he didn't have to relearn. And by the way, Sometimes it's a whole lot harder to relearn something that you've learned the wrong way than it is to learn something fresh to begin with. Paul had all of this information stored in his heart and in his mind and in his soul that he had believed with every ounce of his being that all of a sudden, after one encounter with Jesus on this road to Damascus, is unraveled. And it's not that the information that he has in his heart is wrong. It's that his understanding of it is wrong. What, what he learned was not the wrong thing. It was just the wrong assessment of it. The wrong way of understanding and seeing what God had. God changed everything. My friends, what we need this morning truly, no matter where we are in our Christian walk, is to truly see Jesus who he is. To see Jesus for who he is and what he desires to accomplish in his life. This happens in Paul's life in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And notice how he finishes the statement, of whom I am chief. Don't think that because Saul had God change his name to Paul and he became the great minister of Christ to the Gentiles and he was risen up to be what most would, would argue the greatest Christian that the world has ever known, uh, that, uh, that we would look at him and think that he was welled up in pride and welled up believing that, hey, God's done something great with me and I'm somebody. Paul's view of himself was... I am the chiefest of all sinners. Why? Because he understood how great and how uh, wicked his sin was as he persecuted the church of God. Now listen, we, we would view our sinful state and being really uh, egregiously sinful if we were people that uh, were vastly immoral or that were, uh, that were people that were abusers of others. And he was that. But he wasn't someone that was just in his own persona uh, cruel to those that he loved and those that he worked with. You get around some people and they're just hateful and cruel. It doesn't matter who they're with. Paul wasn't that way in his, in his regular deportment, it doesn't seem. But, what, but it was when it came to the Christians because he viewed them as, uh, as an enemy. And what he sees himself as is someone that though he was, had a great love for God, he had a great commitment to God. He had a great commitment to the Word of God. He just missed his Messiah up until this point. 
he saw himself as someone that was the chiefest of all sinners. God kept him humble and he followed the Lord in that way. He never forgot the price that he inflicted and the pain that he inflicted on others. In Romans chapter 1 uh, and verse 14 he said, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What is Paul saying? He's saying, listen, I owe a debt to those that I persecuted. I owe a debt to the God that saved me, to Jesus that found me on that road. I am, my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price, he would write. I am the one, I am one that uh, God has resonated with, that God has come to, that God has taught, that God uh, has spoken to. And the Apostle Paul has come to his, a place in his life where he just says, listen, I am, no matter what position I attain, no matter how many uh, people come to Christ, no matter how many uh, would, <coughs> would, uh, would look at me and say uh, that God has used me in a magnificent way, I am the chiefest of of sinners and I am a debtor to those that I destroyed and that I imprisoned and that I persecuted and I'm a debtor to those that need to hear the power of the Lord Jesus Christ yet still. Paul finds himself here on this road and he finds not God's judgment but God's grace, not God's wrath but God's mercy. The grace of God was a great thing to Paul. Someone once wrote, I don't know who wrote this, the author, it's just, I've found it written, but it's, it's marked as unknown. My understanding of the greatness of God's grace is directly proportional to my understanding of the wickedness of my sin. If I see my sin as a small, trivial matter, I by default reduce the grace of God to a trivial thing. And how true that is. We don't see Jesus as great and mighty and powerful personally in our lives because we don't see our sin as being great and costing as much. We would look in our own heart, though we would never say it this way, but we live this way, that, you know, I'm not a murderer and I'm not this and I haven't been cruel, so Jesus died to save my sin and I realize I'm a sinner and I'm grateful, but it didn't take as much mercy and it didn't take as much grace and it didn't take as much of his blood to forgive and wash my sins away because I wasn't that great of a sinner. So the suffering was great, but my cause of his suffering wasn't that great. And so we don't see the sacrifice as being such an enormous thing for us personally. We don't, we don't say that. We don't really think that in our minds openly, but we live as if that's the way that we view it. My smallest sin caused his greatest suffering. And the Apostle Paul comes realizing, Jesus would, would put it this way, he, he, he talked as he was anointed and the, the woman anointing him was rebuked. He said, you don't know what she's been forgiving. I'm paraphrasing, of course, and uh, she, she is showing me much love because she has been forgiven of much. And she loves much because she's been forgiven much. Why do we not love much? Why do we not sacrifice much? Why are we not fully committed? Why are we not committed much? It is in proportion to the, to the way that we view the sacrifice and the cost of God upon us. Do we see ourselves as a debtor to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we see ourselves as a debtor to those that have sacrificed their lives to pave the way that we might sit in the air conditioning today instead of out under a tree uh, in the jungle somewhere, in a, on a plane somewhere, because we've all of the amenities of modern life. Uh, do we not see those that, that brought the gospel forth? Do we not understand the, 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 the debt that we owe them, the debt and the sacrifice of those that brought the gospel uh, to us, that we might know all that Jesus Christ is? Paul says, I am debtor. I owe a debt. Listen, my friends, I owe a debt to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. I owe a debt to those that were burned at the stake to preserve the gospel. I owe a debt to those uh, that, that sacrificed to make sure that I could hear the gospel in my 
early years and it wasn't that we were brought to church on a regular basis and it was easy for the gospel to find its way into my life. But God loved me enough that he found a way. And for me to fully experience Jesus in my life, I must understand who he is. If he is great to me, he will be great in me. And so I have to understand that I want to see Jesus for who he is. And Paul is asking the question. He knows he serves God, but he knows that it's God that has met him on the road. But who are you? I'm Jesus. And as Paul asked and declared, who art thou, Lord? So must we understand and declare who Jesus is in our own hearts and in our own minds and in our own lives. Because how I see myself, how I see my sin, and how I see the greatness of God's mercy and grace in my life are directly proportional to how I see my sin and what Jesus has done for me. So who is he? Who is Jesus, as Paul asks? Well, first of all, this morning, consider that he is a willing substitute. Jesus did not go to the cross because it was demanded. He went because he was willing. He did not go coerced. He went because he loved. And I understand uh, that, that he made the choice, but he made the choice before we were even created. He knew prior to creation what the result was going to be and what the cost was going to be and what the, the, the redemption was going to require and he created anyway. He is a willing substitute. He is not there because they were able to shackle him and put him there. He is there because he willingly went and offered himself a sacrifice uh, for our sin. And so as we consider this morning what Paul is asking and what Jesus is revealing simply when he says, I am. He is showing him, listen, I am a willing sac substitute. I'm willing to pay a price and a debt that you cannot pay. In Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, verse number 2, he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, listen, he came and he offered himself a willing sacrifice for the joy that was set before him. And my friends, you are that joy. I am that joy. I may not bring joy into anybody else's life on this world, but I bring it to Jesus. And he, he loved me enough and took enough joy in me that he was willing to offer himself a sacrifice. In Titus chapter number 2, in verse number 14, uh, the Apostle Paul writes uh, and tells us this, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Listen, Paul was zealous. He was zealous of good works. What His, his motive was not bad. His vision was corrupt. Who he saw Jesus as was corrupt. And Jesus says, listen, I want you to be uh, zealous for me. I want you to be committed to me. I want you uh, to give your, uh, your lives in obedience to me. And I, I want you to be a peculiar people, not peculiar in that, uh, and that we're some kind of a, of a, of a weird sideshow, but peculiar in the sense that we love God with all of our hearts. That we're committed to his work in our lives and to allowing him to work freely in us. In John's gospel, uh, in chapter number 10, in verse number 18, John's gospel chapter 10 and verse 18, uh, we find him saying this, uh, John writing this, <clears throat> No man taketh it from me. He's speaking of his life. Uh, in verse, back to verse 17, Therefore doth my father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. And Jesus is making the case, Paul, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And I went to that cross that you deny. And I gave myself 
and, and, and sacrifice for sin, which you've denied. And I went to a grave, and I did raise from the dead, which you deny. I am here to show you exactly who God is, and that I am all that was prophesied uh, before you. And what do we see here this morning? We see this, that he's a willing substitute. That he made that sacrifice for the joy that was set before him. Listen, never lose sight of the fact when you feel at your lowest, when you feel at your worst, that Jesus loved you and cared for you so much that on the cross, as he suffered, you were the joy that was set before him. I can't imagine being in an environment where all I feel is crushing, destructive pain and agony and suffering. But Hebrews 12, 2 makes it pretty clear that while he was going through that agony and suffering, he was thinking about us. I don't know how he could divert his attention from the agony and the pain. But the joy that was set before him was in his heart and his mind. He was willing because of his love for us. In John uh, chapter 15 and verse 13, he says, Greater man hath no man than this, and a man laid down his life for his friends. There is no greater expression of love than the expression that Jesus gave us on Calvary's cross. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He went he took that burden upon himself for us. He's a willing substitute. Don't let anyone ever convince you that the Romans took him or that the Jews had the power to force him to that cross. He made it clear that at any moment he could have called for the angels to come and to deliver him, but he didn't. They had no power. He gave his life freely. He is a willing sacrifice. Not only do we see that he's a willing sacrifice, but we see, secondly, that he's a worthy sacrifice. You know, it's not enough for someone to just be willing to go and pay a debt <coughs> if they don't have the means by which to pay it. It doesn't matter how willing they are. If I had uh, a, 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 some financial trouble and someone came along and said, Pastor, you're six months behind on your house payment and they're going to take your house away from you. I'm willing to come and help you, but you're in the same boat that I'm in. You're just as far behind on your house payment as I am. It doesn't matter how willing you are because you don't have what's acceptable to satisfy the debt. Listen, it doesn't matter how much Jesus loved us if his sacrifice was unworthy, if he wasn't able to stand in our stead. But he was. He is a worthy sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse number 22, he said, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and that they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, Jesus, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore." What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that he is a worthy sacrifice because he was a holy sacrifice. That he was separate from sinners. That he did not have that sinful nature. That he was everything that was required to make a one-time eternal sacrifice and atonement for sin. What had to be done annually by animal ritual sacrifice to show the coming of Messiah to temporarily appease and hold off the wrath of God throughout the ages from the establishment of the tabernacle until the resurrection of Christ. Jesus satisfied on the cross. No one else could have done it. 
His sacrifice was a worthy sacrifice. Not only that, his sacrifice not only was holy, but it was able to fulfill and to pay the debt that we owed. In Hebrews chapter number 9, uh, beginning in verse number 24, uh, he says this. Uh, he says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have often suffered... <coughs> since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation my friends our debt has been paid in full and it was accepted by God because he is a worthy sacrifice. Worthy in that he's holy. Worthy in that his debt, uh, our debt has been paid by him. And worthy because God has accepted the sacrifice. Listen, my friends, it doesn't matter how much Jesus loves us. It doesn't matter how many times over he would have sacrificed himself for us. If the Father would not have accepted the sacrifice, it would have been all uh, for naught. But he was that acceptable sacrifice. Again, as we saw in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It all begins and ends with the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 1 uh, and verses 3 and 4, uh, Paul writes and says, Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Listen, if there was any doubt as to Jesus' deity and him being God in the flesh, flesh and the son of the father it was answered without an ability to refute it when he rose from the grave it was all put to rest and I'm saying this morning that when the apostle Paul saw Jesus whom he was going to persecute on the road to Damascus and he fell down and he looked up and he heard the voice and he said who art thou Lord the answer back from heaven is I am Jesus I am willing. I am worthy. Consider thirdly that he is a whole or a complete Savior. We don't have a partial Savior in Jesus. We don't have to live a partially consecrated life in Christ Jesus. We have access to the Father through the Son. <clears throat> Dr. John Wildward, who taught at Dow Theological Seminary in the early 1900s, like pre-World War II, I think he began teaching there in the mid-1930s, said this of Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ in his death fully satisfied the demands of a righteous God for judgment upon sinners and as their infinite sacrifice provided a ground not only for the believer's forgiveness, but for his justification and sanctification. Listen, we have everything that we need in the Lord Jesus Christ. When he met Paul on that road, he said, Paul, I'm everything that you'll ever need. I'm everything that you think that I'm not. I'm everything that you've ever pursued. I am everything that you've ever learned of. Everything that you learned of me from the law, that you learned of the law and the prophets, you learned of me. They testify of me. They proclaim to you me. I am not uh, some new mysterious figure to you. You just have to open your eyes and and let me open them and the Spirit of God open them so that you can clearly see that all that you have studied and learned has pointed you to me. And you must accept that I am your Savior. What are we saved from? Well, we're saved first of all from the judgment of our sin. We rightfully should stand 
in judgment before the wrath of God for our sin. But because of Jesus in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, we learn that he is the propitiation or the substitute for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He didn't just die for you and he didn't just die for me and he didn't just die for people in the Western Hemisphere or the, or the Eastern Hemisphere. He didn't just die uh, for people of one nation or another or one, uh, one ethnic group or another. He is the Savior of the world. It doesn't matter this morning if you're red, red white, yellow, pink, black, uh, or polka dotted. You are a child of God if you've trusted him as your Savior. He died for you. He loves you. He he wants to empower and strengthen you for his glory. So pastor, but what about my this and what about my that and what about what I've done and what about my sinful past and what about that? And listen, there's no one here who has a more wicked and storied past than the Apostle Paul. The, the, the worst of sinners did what they did in ignorance. Murderers, whoremongers, are not, many of them do their, their, commit their sin in ignorance. They're just products of their culture. They just do what everybody else around them is doing. And they have no way to even know that what they're doing is wrong until the light comes on. Paul knew and chose to persecute. And Jesus comes and says, Paul, I am a whole complete savior to you. I am here to save you from the judgment of your sin. I'm glad that you feel like you owe a debt. But your debt has been paid. I know that you feel as if you're the most wicked of all sinners. That you're the chiefest of sinners. But you're a saved sinner. So your sin is gone forever. You are complete. The judgment of sin for you is gone. In regards to your salvation and position in Christ. We are saved my friends this morning. If we've trusted Christ as Savior from the judgment of our sin. You don't have to worry about hell. You don't have to worry about a lake of fire. You don't have to worry about being banished and separated for God, from God for all of eternity. If you've trusted him as your savior, repented of your sin and came to him and received Christ, all of that is paid and forgiven and is gone for eternity. Amen. We're saved from the judgment of sin, but we also can be saved from the bondage of our sin. There are a lot of people this morning that know that they've been saved from the judgment of their sin, but they still live in bondage to that sin. They either will not accept that God is fully forgiven or could or would fully forgiven or they cannot forgive themselves or they, uh, they stumble along and they live uh, under the yoke of that sin for, uh, and failure and mistakes that have been made and decisions that were bad that have been made and we simply let them hover over our heads and strangle our ability to serve God with freedom and with liberty and with passion. And I'm just telling you this morning that Jesus says... I've saved you from all of that. He didn't say, Paul, I want you to get up off this road and I want you to begin going uh, about repairing all the damage you've done. He said, I want you to get up and I want you to go to Damascus and I want you to wait. And I'm going to send somebody that's going to show you what you need to do. I have chosen you. I have something for you to do. I have a design and a purpose and a plan for you. My friends... All of those things that he said to Saul, he says to us. I'm not saying that we're the apostle to some new people. I'm saying that he has a plan for our lives. He has a purpose for our lives. There's a reason why he wants to work in our hearts and in our lives. And we are saved this morning, not just from sin's bondage or, or judgment, but from its bondage. Romans chapter 6 and <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 19, he said, I speak after the manner of men because of the affirmity of your flesh, for ye have yielded yourself members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and unto iniquity. Even so now yield ye your members, servants to righteousness and unto holiness. He says, I want you to yield yourself like you once obeyed your flesh, obey my spirit. Yield yourself. Verse 14, he said, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. The law, my friends, has been fulfilled. And we stand in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to experience him and to live him and to allow him to live through us freely. Not only have we been saved from a sin's judgment and sin's bondage, but we have been saved to serve him. Paul didn't say, okay, 
I've forgiven you. I've saved you. I want you now uh, to just go to Damascus and just, just wait there. Just, just go into hiding. Just let the people forget about the persecution. And, uh, and, and, and I've, I've rescued the people in a way that they didn't understand. No, he said, I've got something for you to do. Go. And it will be shown you what you must do. So what are we saved for? We're saved to serve. In 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy rather, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, he said, Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Listen, my friends, if you're saved this morning, you have not been called into a spirit of fear. You have not been called to live in the, in the, under the yoke of the, of the guilt of sin. All of that has been paid for. All of that can be lifted. You are at liberty in Christ Jesus, but you are not, and I am not at liberty to just go out and do what I want, when I want, how I want. I have been called to serve my, my living Savior. So, Pastor, what does that service look like for me? Well, that's, you've got to spend some time with Jesus and figure out. Paul was told to go to Damascus and wait, and it will be shown what you must do. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to be praying. I'm supposed to be walking with him. I'm supposed to be seeking him. I'm supposed to learn his word. I'm supposed to do all of these things that I'm, I'm, I'm waiting with excitement for God to reveal to me what his plan for my life is, that I might walk with him in it and fulfill it. Actually, it's him fulfilling it in me. Because I don't have the strength and the power to do it. And he didn't design me to do it on my own. He said, take my yoke upon you. He said, come here with me. God's not looking to walk with us. He's looking for us to walk with him. It's to get in step with him. Who is Jesus this morning? He is the savior of my soul. Who is Jesus? He is a supplier of my needs. Who is Jesus? He is the sustainer of my worth. Who is Jesus? He is my guide. Who is Jesus? He is my friend. Who is Jesus? He can be my joy. Who is Jesus? He should be my king. And the right answer is, Lord, who art thou? And the answer from heaven, I am. Jesus. Everything that you've ever needed, everything that you'll ever need, I am. Who is Jesus to you this morning? If I were to pass out a slip of paper and say just quickly write on that paper who Jesus is to you, and don't give me a theological answer. Don't tell me, well, he's my savior. He's, tell me who he really is to you. What would you say? And the bottom line is, is it really doesn't matter what it would say to me. But it does matter what I say to him. I'm confronted. I'm convicted. I'm forgiven. I'm raised. I'm directed to Damascus, Paul says, to wait. He doesn't know what he's waiting for. He can't see. Though he's seeing clearly, spiritually, for the first time. Until Ananias shows up and the scales fall off of his eyes. And he begins the new life. My friends, this morning, for some of you, it's time to begin a new life with Christ. For some of you, it's time to stop kicking against the pricks. Stop fighting against what God's trying to do in your heart. Stop fighting his conviction in your heart. Start fighting his speaking to you. Stop fighting his speaking to you in your soul and your spirit. And just surrender. There is no greater power. There is no greater love. There is no greater strength. And there is no greater cause for which to give your life than the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Pastor, I don't know if I can do that. Well, you only can and I only can in proportion to how I answer the question, who art thou, Lord?